What's up everyone, it's Adam from FWCI. On this week's episode, we're going to be talking about NXT 2.0, AEW Grand Slam, where did all the Aussies show up in the PWI 500, all the regular segments as well. Let's jump into it. This is World Wrestling Australia, episode 43. We'll kick things off with the Aussie wrestler watch as we always do with the nightmare on Raw, Rhea Ripley. She had a win this week over Natalia, but this is all still a part of this storyline where she's teaming up with Nikki A.S.H. and they're going against Tamina and Natalia for the women's tag titles. I don't want to see this duo win the tag titles. And I feel like Rhea's starting to become a bit of a spineless babyface just by agreeing to tag with Nikki Cross instead of going after the championships. But can you imagine Rhea Ripley and crazy Nikki Cross as a team? That's something that I would totally get behind. So the superhero character is definitely not doing it for me. But Rhea's still picking up the win on Raw. Big week for Jonah, but I'm going to talk more about that in the Jonah Twitter check-in later on in the show. Tony Storm finally had a match on SmackDown as kind of like the sidekick to Liv Morgan in a uh, count-out victory over Carmella and Zelina Vega. She was very much a side player in this. It was a very inauspicious uh, re-debut, it almost feels like at this point, but Tony Storm, technically on SmackDown. Indy Hartwell tied the knot with Dexter Loomis this week, but I'm going to talk about that whole segment in more detail later on in the show. Grayson Waller was in the corner of Drake Maverick on uh, NXT this week. Maverick would lose to Ridge Holland, and uh, Waller's reactions during that match were fantastic. But they're still carrying on with Drake Maverick and Grayson Waller, which is good to see. And Duke Hudson was beaten down by Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams on NXT 2.0 this week. I don't know if that makes him a babyface now, but when I think about it, I can see a babyface Duke Hudson. He could end up being quite a funny character. He's got a very unique sort of humor about him, even as a heel. So I don't know. Maybe he's going to be a babyface from now. Maybe he's going to join up with Grayson Waller and Drake Maverick. Who knows? Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Bad News Barrett. Yes, this is the news. And obviously the big news this week was Big E cashing in the money in the bank on the WWE champion Bobby Lashley and winning the championship on Raw. This is his first championship reign. And you know what? Long may he reign. Big E is awesome. We got to see some big meaty men slapping meat, which is always Big E's, you know, thing that he likes to say. So great moment on Raw. Congratulations to Big E. So WWE has managed to sign Gable Steveson. Steveson won the gold medal at the last Olympics, and he's basically considered one of the sport's hottest potential signings uh, following his Olympic gold medal victory at the Tokyo 2020 Games, 2021 Games. I don't know how to say it anymore. The 21-year-old was linked with a career in football, MMA, and professional wrestling before WWE announced the acquisition last week so uh, that's a huge get this guy could easily be the next Kurt Angle or Brock Lesnar he looks amazing he clearly wants to do this uh, we're gonna have to see what the future holds for Gable Steveson and the PWI 500 came out this week and I'm gonna have a quick talk about where the Aussies landed the evaluation period for the PWI 500 is the 1st of July 2020 to the 30th of June 2021 and the criteria is as follows in-ring achievement, which is their win-loss record, championships and tournaments won. Influence, which is visibility and prestige within a promotion and or the industry. Technical ability, quality of maneuvers, matches and in-ring psychology. Competition, success against the most varied and high quality opponents. Activity, minimum 10 matches total or six matches in separate months. That's the criteria. I like the fact that they actually reveal that and break it down. It's not just some arbitrary list. And I'm going to have a look at the top 10 and then see where the Aussies landed. So number one on the list was Kenny Omega, the huge year in AEW. Roman Reigns was number two. I could have put Roman at number one. I'm not going to lie. He had a pretty impressive 12 months. Bobby Lashley was number three. Drew McIntyre was number four. Kota Ibushi up there at number five. John Moxley at 6, Will Ospreay at 7, Finn Balor at 8, Shingo Takagi at 9, and Rich Swan at 10. What a 
change in fortune it's been for Rich Swan since he joined Impact Wrestling. He had some stuff going on when he first signed up. But that's the top 10 and, you know, congratulations to those guys. The women's list comes out next month, I believe, but we're going to have a look at how the Aussies went on the men's list. We had Bronson Reed, or aka Jonah, at number 73. Adam Brooks, friend of the show, at 210. Number 378 was Slapjack. 407 was Robbie Eagles over in Japan doing his thing. And 439, Grayson Waller. So that's where the Aussies landed. That's pretty fair, I would say. Bronson Reed had some huge matches, but still being number 73 is not too bad at all. So that's where the Aussies all landed in the PWI 500. Fellas, what is going on? It is the loose ledge, Adam Brooks here, and you are watching World Wrestling Straya. I love that name, Straya. Buff Bagwell has a podcast called Rebuilding Buff, and he went on a bit of a rant about WWE covering rehab for other wrestlers and allegedly refusing to do the same for him. So Bagwell made a series of kind of bizarre statements about how AEW would hire him and DDP praising Buff for his amazing physical condition and claiming that that is the reason that nobody knows there's anything wrong with Buff. And this is the result of the lack of rehab support, presumably by WWE, I guess. But there's no time frame on any of this information from Buff. WWE has openly offered to cover rehab costs for anyone who's been under contract with them in any way in the past. And they appear to have lived up to that. So... I don't know what to make of this. Buff Bagwell, you know, bless him. He's, for, okay, for a better look at what Buff Bagwell's life has been like after WWE and before WWE, for that fact, I recommend going and checking out the Crime and Sports podcast with James Petrogallo and Jimmy Wisman. They did an episode all about Buff Bagwell recently that is absolutely insane. They cover his career and criminal history in a very lighthearted kind of way. It's a very entertaining conversation to hear. It's basically a Buff Bagwell Dark Side of the Ring episode in audio format that goes for about three hours. But, speaking of Dark Side of the Ring, Impact has suspended Tommy Dreamer for comments he made on Thursday night's broadcast of Dark Side of the Ring on Vice. In a statement obtained by John Pollock of Post Wrestling, Impact Wrestling has said, we're aware of Tommy Dreamer's comments on Dark Side of the Ring. The views expressed by him in the interview are completely unacceptable. We can confirm that Mr. Dreamer was suspended this morning with immediate effect pending further action. Uh, Dreamer was basically defending the actions of Ric Flair on this flight, who apparently was, you know, naked, throwing his junk around, sexually harassing um, flight attendants, sexually assaulting flight attendants from the sounds of things, making them touch him and cornering this woman and things like that. Uh, it was a wild story. The episode is definitely worth checking out. You can check out uh, Dark Side of the Ring on the SBS On Demand app. But... Uh, Dreamer didn't come out looking too good because they kind of spliced in some other interviews from the actual stewardess that was being harassed by Ric Flair. And Dreamer's comments were a little bit uh, in bad taste. I think he was just being very, very honest, but it just didn't come across great for him in the documentary. And it looks like Impact is deciding what action to take next. In AEW news, a uh, fun episode of Dynamite this week. We had Rosario Dawson, who is one of the co-hosts on the, the show that Cody Rhodes is a host on, the, the big show, I think it's called, funny enough. Um, she was at ringside and would get into it with Malachi Black, jumping on Black's back as uh, Cody Rhodes was coming down the, uh, the stairs in the crowd. So fun to see more celebrities getting involved in the AEW product and this was a really fun segment to watch. Adam Cole won his AEW debut as if there was any doubt that he wouldn't pinning Kazarian in the middle of the ring and after the match dubbing that the super click is back so big night for Adam Cole in AEW and in the main event it was John Moxley and Eddie Kingston going up against 2.0 not NXT 2.0. I'm talking about 2.0, the tag team. This is like the second out of three weeks I think we've seen them in the main event, which I love to see. I don't know who they know in AEW, why they've come in with such great treatment, but for fun, you know, goofy jobber tag team, these guys are absolutely perfect. But it was obviously Moxley getting the win. After the match, Minoru Suzuki would come down to the ring and they told the story that Suzuki was really upset that AEW... 
uh, you know, jobbed him out with his entrance the week before against Moxley, that they didn't allow the song to play and they cut it off, which I think they did for time, but they've turned this into a whole storyline about, you know, Suzuki feeling disrespected and he came out to challenge Moxley. They would have a bit of a brawl after the uh, match as well. So crazy end for Dynamite. On Rampage, it was the Lucha Bros defending their AEW Tag Team Championships against the Butcher and the Blade in a really fun match. In a highlight for me, Penelope Ford taking out Tay Conte and Anna Jay with a set of brass knuckles after the match. I really enjoy Penelope Ford's work and yeah, happy to see her getting some uh, violent acts in on this show. The main event was Miro defending the TNT Championship against Fuego Del Sol, but this time it wasn't just the title that was on the line, it was Fuego's new car that he bought with his new AEW contract, which is just so cool to see them doing something fun with that little wrinkle in the storyline. Miro with the very decisive victory, but after the match, Sammy Guevara would run out and attack Miro, so it looks like we might see Sammy Guevara taking the TNT Championship from Miro at some point in the future, but I also wouldn't hate to see Miro just, you know, tear through him as well. AEW also announced next week AEW Grand Slam so uh, it's going to be AEW Dynamite and then Rampage is also going to have an extra hour on it so we're going to have four hours of AEW next week apparently it's going to be like a two night pay per view over that week which I think this is the right way to do this kind of thing now that you've got Dynamite so we're going to have a look at what matches they've announced for this because there's some pretty big matches going on. On AEW Dynamite Grand Slam it's going to be the AEW World Champion Kenny Omega with Don Callis versus Brian Danielson. I don't think that's going to be for the championship, but hey, I'm always down to see that match. Cody Rhodes and Malachi Black are going to settle their issue, which has been going on for a few weeks. So good to see Malachi Black just enter into a feud and stay focused on that during his first, you know, couple of months in the company. Another match I'm really excited for, they did a good job building this up next week, is MJF versus Brian Pillman Jr. MJF's clearly going to get the win here, but I'm enjoying Pillman Jr.'s work, but I'm enjoying MJF a lot more. And still on Dynamite, the AEW Women's Champion will defend her title against Ruby Soho. So it's going to be Ruby Soho, Britt Baker, DMD for the AEW Women's Championship. And FTR will be facing Sting and his son, Darby Allin, in a tag team match as well. So they're also going to get Sting out there to have a match. Huge episode of Dynamite. But it continues on Rampage with a six-man tag team match with the Super Click, which is Adam Cole, baby. The Young Bucks versus the Jurassic Express, which is Luke Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy and Christian Cage so that's a feud that's been building up for quite a while and now we've got Adam Cole injected into that as well it's great to see them not hesitate to use Adam Cole on TV CM Punk will be facing powerhouse Will Hobbs on Rampage that's going to be a great match and it's good to see them use CM Punk to get more eyes on the Rampage show make it not this imbalance like WWE has done in the past but make both of these shows worth watching after a weird promo segment on this week's Dynamite it's going to be Chris Jericho Jericho and Jake Hager going up against the men of the year so Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky in a tag team match but you know glad we still get to see a bit of Chris Jericho I thought he'd take some time off but shows what I know because he's still going strong on Rampage on AEW Grand Slam week NXT 2.0 yes let's have a chat about this uh it's the first week of the new NXT format um, the Performance Center, I'm not that impressed with what they've done with it, to be honest. I don't know why it took weeks to get it done, because that looks like it was just kind of slapped up there for, you know, over a weekend. But um, the show was pretty impressive, and I, I'll, I'll talk about why that still doesn't fill me with much um, optimism. But let's have a look through the matches and we'll talk about it. Bron Breaker defeated LA Knight in the opening match. This was confusing booking. Bron Breaker is the son of Rick Steiner, nephew of Scott Steiner, who he sounds a hell of a lot like, by the way. But he came and basically challenged LA Knight to a match. LA Knight's in the Fatal 4-Way main event, and Bron Breaker just beat him clean in the middle of the ring. So, uh, good way to build somebody up, I guess, but I don't know why LA Knight took that match and why that happened. And is that an example of what they're going to be doing to some of the more seasoned talent that's on the roster? Are they just going to be not even jobbing them out, just forgetting that they even exist kind of thing? Like, it's very, very bizarre. Um, in a tag team match, Imperium defeated the team of Josh Briggs and Brooks Jensen. Jensen's a young fella. 
Josh Briggs doesn't do anything for me. Uh, Imperium looking impressive, specifically Marcel Bartel. He was looking shredded. I think he's been spending a lot of time with Fabian Eichner, who's a, definitely a bit of a body guy. But good match by Imperium. Uh, not really impressed with the other team. B-Fab from Hit Row defeated Katrina Cortez, who is a luchadora that I've never heard of, but I love Lucha Libre so much. I was definitely in the Cortez corner during this match. Uh, she would beat her in a very short match. After that, it was Electra Lopez coming out with Legado del Fantasma to basically set up, I don't know if it's going to be a match between the two females or if it's going to be some intergender eight-person tag match. But there's still a lot more going on between Hit Row and Legado del Fantasma. Carmelo Hayes came out and introduced uh, Trick Williams, who I guess is a friend of his and looks like it's going to be his manager from now on. This seemed like a bit of a heel turn, to be honest. Trick Williams basically instilled this, you know, very... Um, fired up, aggressive attitude in Carmelo Hayes that Hayes seemed to adopt. After that, Duke Hudson would pop his Aussie head out and uh, have a few words for Hayes. That instigated Trick Williams to go and attack Duke Hudson. The two of them would beat down Duke Hudson and leave him laying in the middle of the ring. So, I don't know, again, if this is a heel turn for Carmelo and a babyface turn for Hudson, it's definitely a heel turn for Carmelo Hayes, but I gotta give it one more. Melo! Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter defeated Gigi Dolan and JC Jane by disqualification when a brunette Mandy Rose would attack and interfere in this match. They would then turn this into a six-person tag team match, which ended up with Gigi Dolan, JC Jane, and Mandy Rose defeating Catanzaro, Carter, and Saray, who also entered the fray. Hey, hey. I don't know, lay by the bay and eat things out of hay. I just may, what do you say? Ridge Holland defeated Drake Maverick with Grayson Waller in his corner. The Diamond Mine has added a new tag team. It is Julius and Brutus Creed. They defeated Dan Jarman and Trevor Skelly. Um, these guys are nuts. <laughs> um, they look like jobbers last week and they still kind of do, but they look pretty goddamn intense. So I'm curious to see more of these guys. I feel like we had a double dose of the Steiner Brothers nostalgia on this show. We had Bron Breaker who looks like his dad and sounds like his uncle and then we have these blokes that are wrestling like a couple of young steiners as well so curious to see where these guys go after that match malcolm bivens would introduce ivy nile as the newest member of the diamond mine so crazy that they've managed to keep this uh, faction going after all the uh, the black friday firings that happened some months ago and they got rid of half of their squad so kyle o'reilly was attacked backstage by pete dunn and uh, ridge holland but they were chased off by this new fellow called von wagner wagner would also replace o'reilly in the main event considering o'reilly was unfit to compete Wagner, first night, William Regal said, we're throwing you into the fire, and he would be in that main event. The NXT Championship was on the line with Samoa Joe relinquishing the title on the weekend. It was Tommaso Ciampa versus LA Knight versus Pete Dunne versus Von Wagner for the NXT Championship. This was a fun match, but it was Ciampa picking up the win and getting reunited with Goldie. I didn't think it was going to happen. I don't know who I thought was going to win this match. It all kind of happened very suddenly, but... Champer is now the NXT champion, and he's got Goldie back in his possession, which is fantastic to see. After that, we would see Bron Breaker have a little bit of a uh, stare down with Tommaso Champer. So they're clearly trying to get some of the new younger talent on the screen and on the show. I don't understand why they couldn't have just done that while Triple H was still in charge of NXT. I feel like if he got told that's what you have to do, he would have done it. So this is, whole situation is still very, very weird, but I don't hate getting some of the younger talent a bit of a story to help build up their, you know, reputation and their story. So the show was entertaining, but Vince McMahon has an ability to put on entertaining shows. He seems to have lost the ability to put on consistently entertaining shows. He can have these big, you know, almost publicity stunt type of events where we bring this guy back and this person's going to return and three or four big things are all going to happen on a show and get everybody hyped. But when you go forward the next three or four weeks, a lot of that just kind of peters out into nothing and we get back to where we were originally. That's where I'm going to save my judgment on the new NXT, maybe until the end of the year. Give it a couple of months to see what this is actually going to be like. I do appreciate the direction that they're trying to take it, and NXT being a developmental territory has always been fine with me, and I've always kind of considered it that. But we're going to have to wait and see how this goes when they don't have the ability to have debuts and title matches and stuff like that. 
how are they going to keep this show interesting? But now that I've had a chance to see NXT, I'm still going to be covering it on this show along with AEW and all the regular segments, just like this one right here. Oh, Nakamura has swiped the crown again. Oh, 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 oh. So Baron Corbin attacked Kevin Owens on SmackDown, which was not very happy of him since he's happy Corbin these days. But did he win the NXT Championship? He did not. This week's Better Than Baron Corbin is Tommaso Ciampa, the NXT Champion, reunited with Goldie after 900 and some odd days apart. This is such a great moment, but Ciampa going from being in a fatal four-way number one contenders match to holding the championship instead. What a week, what a way to capitalize on that. Tommaso Ciampa, Better Than Baron Corbin. So this week's You Gotta Be Joking Me is a bit of a quick one, but do you guys ever check out the WWE YouTube content? They have started editing down these videos to just a ridiculous degree. I went to have a look at Big E cashing in the money in the bank on Bobby Lashley, and they literally show Big E running out with the briefcase, and then they fade cut to Big E holding the championship. They did not show any of the match at all. I don't think you even saw Bobby Lashley in the video. It was all Big E. Very, very weird. Feels like it's getting a little bit clickbaity. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Yeah, nah, is it getting clickbaity? Yeah. You gotta be joking me. And you know, I can't have it. You gotta be joking me without following it up with a little bit of positivity. So let's have a look at this week's You Beauty. You Beauty. Oh. You Beauty. The Index Wedding was absolutely amazing this week. This has been such a well-crafted storyline. They've had so much fun with it. There have been matches involved. There have been a lot of backstage segments, a lot of toing and froing. It all started with the Johnny Gargano feud and then Austin Theory getting kidnapped. And the whole thing has just been a really fun, goofy, silly wrestling romance to follow along with. But they really capped it off this week with the wedding. We started off with the groomsmen backstage, all dressed dressed like Loomis in their, um, you know, black turtlenecks and their leather gloves. And then suddenly there's a knock on the door and Austin Theory is back. He's one of the groomsmen. He even has a hug with Johnny Gargano, which was nice to see. Later in the show, we cut to Dexter Loomis combing his mustache in the, uh, in the mirror, which was good to see him getting, you know, spruced up for the wedding. And the wedding itself was a whole heap of fun. We had Gargano walking Indy to the ring like the weird pseudo father figure that he's become, I guess. There were wrestlers all around the ring and and uh, Ikemanjiro ended up being the one who had everybody's wedding rings, which was a, again, stupid little moment, but hey, you know what? Ikemanjiro's gimmick is he has a jacket. Eh, let's put the wedding rings in there. Why not? When asked if anybody objected, all of the wrestlers watching raised their hands, but Loomis just pulled open his jacket, showing his shiny new axe, and everybody put their hand down and probably a good idea as well. We learned that Dexter's middle name is Gaylord, which I was not aware that it was Dexter Gaylord Lubus, which is absolutely amazing. Indy gives her heartfelt vows and maybe tells us a little bit too much about her relationship with Loomis. Dexter gives her a thumbs up in return, which the minister there was not that impressed with and he gave Dexter a bit of shit about it and said, hey, like this is your wife. Do you not have anything to say to her? Dexter ended up choking him out, leaving no minister to do the actual marrying of the couple. The crowd is chanting for William Regal to go in there. He doesn't want any part of it. <laughs> zombie referees next to him, which is a great weird flashback that NXT has a zombie referee in some cases now. Finally, Beth Phoenix steps up and says she just went registered to be a minister online last night in case this exact thing happened. She married the two, they kiss, and this was maybe one of the only wrestling weddings that went off without uh, a hitch or that actually completed in the ring I don't know but this was fantastic the most entertaining segment on wrestling TV this week and that's why it gets this week's You Beauty You Beauty Aww. You Beauty and a quick Jonah Twitter check in Jonah's got a podcast it's called The Jonah Drome I checked out the first episode it was great he's talking about uh, coming up wrestling in Australia and you know just sort of who he is as a bit of a person next week he's going to talk about his release from the WWE which is the same as the inspiration when they started their podcast they kind of introduced themselves then they got into all the dirt and everything the next week so he's doing the same thing talked a little bit about movies a little bit about hip-hop as well on there a great listen i recommend checking out the jonah drone but the the fact is and he's a he's a 
is a fact for you, mate. And it's time for Yeah Nah. This is the segment where you guys ask me questions down in the comment. I decide is it more yeah or more nah. And then at the end of the month, I give away a wrestling action figure prize pack. This month, it's Karrion Cross and Scarlet. So all you need to do to enter that is use hashtag Yeah Nah TikTok. Leave a wrestling comment. Ask a wrestling question. I'll get to it on the show. Enter as many times as you want. And at the end of September, if you're successful, I'll get in touch with you and we'll get some figures in your hands. But let's have a look at this week's Yeah Nah's. Daniel Jones asks, Yeah Nah, should we have more Aussies on the major shows? So I take it he means over in the States. Yeah Nah. Yeah, especially in AEW. That's such a great product. We have no Aussie representation on that brand at all. So Tony Khan, again, if you're hearing this, get some Aussies on your roster. There's a couple of good free agents out there that you might want to look up. Dylan Marshall Sovi says, what wrestling heel turn is your favorite? Um, Champa has to be up there turning on Johnny Gargano. Um, the whole circumstances surrounding the Hogan NWO heel turn make that one pretty crazy. But I'm going to go with the classic Marty Jannetty trying to dive out of a barbershop window out of cowardice when Shawn Michaels broke up with him. Indie Wrestling Aces asks, in your opinion, who is the best wrestler from Australia? So, I don't think you can answer a question of who is the best. Uh, they're different categories, but I'm going to break it down into three categories. If we're talking about in-ring skills, I don't think you can really go past Buddy Matthews, Buddy Murphy. Uh, you know, the matches that he's had with Mustafa Ali and Roman Reigns as well. I mean, the guy can just go in there and, you know, put on an absolute show with anybody you can shake a stick at. So in-ring skills, definitely Buddy Matthews. In regards to character, I'm just going to lump the inspiration in there as a duo because character-wise, and I've said this on this show before, I find with Aussies, when they go to the States, they often lose a bit of their Aussiness from their character anyway. And the inspiration did not do that. <laughs> they kept all of their Aussiness, all of their boganisms, what's and all. I absolutely love that. I think that's their gear. That's what they need to tap into. And they did such a fantastic job with what they did in WWE. So character-wise, give me the inspiration. In regards to the overall package, now, this person isn't a 10 in every category or anything like that, but overall package, I think Rhea Ripley, she's got all the skills that you could need. I think she would have a lot better chance doing good promos, uh, working somewhere else. I don't know if WWE's style is the right one for her. I don't know if she's going to be better off not being scripted. That's the kind of thing with Rhea. There's a lot of question marks, but from what we've seen, she's been absolutely dominant and Rhea Ripley, hometown Adelaide girl, I think she's got the total package. And that's going to wrap it up. Thank you for joining me this week, everyone. Subscribe and like if you are new to the channel. Don't forget to go check out NBA Straya. The season is coming up. Jimmy's got you covered with everything. For all your NBA news and updates and everything like that, check out NBA Straya. If you like your wrestling action figures, check out the Wrestling With Figs podcast as well with James and Chris. It's a fantastic little podcast that they talk about the collecting of wrestling figures and other stuff from the Aussie perspective. So check out both of those. Don't forget the hashtag yeah, now TikTok. Win yourself carrying cross and scarlet and as always everyone be well stay safe look after your friends see you in the next video peace